These are pretty exciting times in squad. There's a lot changing with the infantry meta, and I think it's um, in the right direction this time around. I think the intentions are good, and I think the implementation is pretty decent. I want to start this off by saying that I really enjoy what they've done with rallies as an inventory item and requiring ammo. It really helps um, either make sure that rallies are built off of fobs and that you have a fob supporting every smaller spawn, or at the very least making sure that there's more teamwork involved with the riflemen and the SL, saving that ammo for rallies, and forcing rally-only attacks or rally-only defenses to be backed by teamwork, rather than just being able to grab one person, throw them over to you, press T, and have an infinite spawn, regardless of whether it doesn't resupply ammo. I think the rally changes are fantastic. I would honestly like to see it go even a bit further and be closer to the Project Reality style of rally. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the reason it's called a rally point is because it used to be a point for you to potentially rally a couple of people who were missing from your squad. You could build them off of fobs or off of APCs and have them in uh, stay consistent, but for the most part it was something where you required quite a few people around you and you could place that to fill in a few people who had died and were not able to catch up, to keep squad cohesion a little bit more tight without having to return all the way back to fobs. But it's regardless a step in the right direction and it's honestly probably good enough um, to really fit with the flow of squad. It doesn't really need to be made more intense, I would just like for it to be a bit more punishing. But anyway, I don't really want to talk about rallies, because I like that change, it was good. I want to talk more about the FOB bleedout system. If you don't know what it is, I will link the patch notes, you can go have a look there. I don't really want to spend the time explaining it. But ultimately, I think it was an idea uh, with good intentions behind it, and I think it kind of succeeds at what it was trying to do. I just think it misses a bit of the bigger picture of squad play. So let's uh, set up a hypothetical situation here. Um, Police station is the midpoint. It's very common for uh, op four to create a fob there and blue four to create a fob here. Early off game start and for it to become a simple fob v fob war. Now, in this kind of a situation, um, most average teams will kind of let the firefight decide who's going to be the victor. If this group of people fights better than that group of people, they will proxy the fob, take it over, and vice versa. When you have good SLs, they will try to outmaneuver the other spawn. They'll try to build another spawn that can flank it, or they'll try to flank it with a rally point to send people in, and try to focus on getting a smaller group to actually intercept that fob and take it down, or create another fob so that in the event that the firefight is lost and your fob goes, you're not entirely out of the fight as you would be right now. However, with less experienced SLs who just push in and join the firefight, there's kind of this second entity, being the engineers on either team. One good engineer can change the match at this point. If the SLs are not outmaneuvering each other and playing fob wars and really playing the high-level meta where you need to outspawn them in various locations, then it comes down to a single experienced engineer to potentially determine the outcome. If one flanks around, takes out the radio solo, Boom, you just won a flag. You just won the midpoint, and that can set in series um, another series of flag captures which can win the game. Besides squad leaders, specifically infantry squad leaders, engineers are the second most powerful single individual in the game. And this change was kind of made to stop that from being the case, to require the engineer to need other people with him, and to require more teamwork than just a solo flanking guy to potentially win the match. This is a big part of squad's mission statement, and their design goal is that everything important should be done with teamwork in mind. Anything that really influences the match should require cooperation and coordination between various people. And the solo engineer is one of the um, worst contradictions to this. A single person who can deliberately stay as far away from his team as possible and accomplish insane things. Now, the issue with this is that it's a tiny bit short-sighted, and it wasn't handled in the greatest possible way. What I mean by the short-sightedness is, let's look at a different example here and say I'm defending school. On defense, the best play is to get yourself a good, solid, spread out spawn network like this. This is going to allow several things. Let's say that the attack comes in from the northeast, right? Um, a full nine-man squad might come in and start proxying this fob. The fact that the fob is there 
has now given us a canary. It's now given us an early warning, and it's now allowing my defenders to push in that direction to counter this push. The fact that I have fobs here and here mean that they are stretched out and they allow for flanking pushes on where I assume the enemy fob is going to be, which I should have a rough idea of since I know that um, our fob is going down and I know the map fairly well and I can make an educated guess as to where they are. Similarly, at this point, I am going to be in my truck, taking preferably an engineer to get a flanking rally point somewhere behind this spawn so that it can be collapsed on by the blocking people in school, a small specialized group coming in from the north to take out the fob, and ultimately this attack has just been halted by sheer respawn advantage. The fact that they got halted up waiting to take down this radio pretty much just killed them. Squad is a spawn-based game, and it doesn't matter if they kill every single person I send to them at school, those people are going to be able to respawn twice over and still affect that squad and still slow them down as they make it to cap range if that squad actually stops and waits for revives. The only way they can negate this advantage is if they get a spawn equally close. For example, let's say they fobbed our fob, which is something I will very commonly do on offense if I see a fob. Now, the distance between our fobs, or our spawns and their spawns, are roughly equal. So even though they're starting on the back foot, they at least have an equal respawn advantage to us, and they are more likely to take school. This is just the way the game plays out when you have respawns as fast as you do in squad. Um, it's always going to be a game of spawns, not a game of firefights. You can win a firefight outright and completely wipe the enemy team, and all you're gaining from that is a little bit of distance before the next wave hits you. All you've gained is that much distance. You haven't actually won the flag because you've wiped everyone on it. You have to have close respawns in order to maintain that pressure and in order to actually have a chance of taking the flag. Now, what this patch did to this kind of gameplay, this kind of spawn-based gameplay, is it made it even more difficult to remove um, spawns, which means that it takes even more time and you're spending even more of your both manpower and time trying to take out one spawn, which then in turn makes these kind of wide spawn networks infinitely more valuable. Since now, when everybody's pushing that, even if they um, fail, this squad is making less progress and is less likely to get close to cap range as they would be before, since it's going to take them longer to ensure that this goes down. And if uh, this squad fails and our team pushing in that direction is able to overcome them, we actually stand an even better chance of recovering this spawn. There's already a huge focus on this spawn-based gameplay, and this is what I always show in my guides, and this is why a lot of people, or sorry, not my guides, but my um, analysis videos, and this is why a lot of people kind of feel bittersweet about those analysis videos, because it's cool squad gameplay, but at the same time it's really just who can shove more fobs down the enemy team's throat better, and it kind of depresses you when you just look at the game design of squad and how it encourages this. And when you have this um, new system, this fob lead out, it just strengthens fobs, which are already the backbone of all offense and defense, and just really broadens the gap between what people think squad is about and the SLs who are fairly new and think they can just shoot their way to victory and think that they can just coordinate their squad, stick together, overcome obstacles, and be able to be rewarded with flag captures, and then these super experienced SLs who understand that concentrating on the firefight is a useless measure, and that they just need to be in a truck with one other person outmaneuvering the team by constantly, constantly placing fobs. So, ultimately, do I think this was a good change? Kind of. Once again, in your average match where people don't understand spawn gameplay and just shoving spawns down throats and you get into this kind of scenario, it does put more emphasis on the firefight and less emphasis on the single individual flanking around. Or if that individual is flanking around, he's going to have to take more people and commit to it um, in order to accomplish the same things, which does encourage team play. But... At the same time, now you have to look at all of the unintended implications. For example, say the commander on this team calls in a UAV and tries to airstrike this fob. They can hit the radio outright and not delete it, and it just takes one person to go over and shovel it. Now it's really wishy-washy when you start talking about spawns. Like, You might ask, is it realistic that an A-10 isn't able to kill a radio? But then you also have to ask the question, is it realistic that a radio allows you to build a HESCO structure which can then birth soldiers out? You know, it's, it's not something where you can really take realism into consideration. But they have tied the FOB 
or the uh, spawn system in this game to physical objects. There is a hab, there is a radio. And the idea that you use C4 to kill the hab or C4 to kill the radio really solidifies this idea of structures supplying spawns and counters to structures being the thing that take out spawns. And when you have this kind of mindset and this kind of aesthetic with your spawn system, it makes no sense at all that an A10 isn't capable of deleting that spawn. You can still go after the hab, but people are just going to rebuild that because they're already there. And the one option you had, which was punishing exposed radios by immediately taking out a fob there with a good play that capitalized on the mistakes of the enemy team, is now gone because the same bleed-out system now allows um, infantry to recover that. So when it comes to the solution to FOB-based gameplay, I think that involves an entirely different mechanic, and I may make a video on it in the future. This is a video specifically regarding feedback to this implemented system, though, and I think this system was trying to accomplish something different and discourage uh, lone wolf gameplay from having as big of an effect on FOB gameplay as it used to not trying to take fobs down a notch and trying to remove fobs as the center of all combat. So I don't really want to get into that discussion, but I do want to talk about how I would have done this differently to accomplish the same things without the drawbacks. And I think the answer is actually fairly simple. First off, I would change the damage output of C4 against radios to take down half of the radio's health rather than most of the radio's health. And then... I would um, change the speed that shovels can take down radios. Right now, the current meta is the engineer places a C4 on the radio, which makes no noise or indication that the radio is under attack unless you're right next to it, and then they start to dig. The moment they start to dig, um, an observant person on the other team will, if they're in radio range, know that the radio is in danger. And by the time they dig it down a little bit to about where it needs to be for the C4 to kill it, the fob will become unspawnable, which will then also alert more people, okay, there's an engineer on the radio. However, at this point, it's pretty much too late. That radio is gone. By the time everyone's got an indication that it's going to go, um, the C4 is already going to detonate, and it's already dug down enough that the C4 is going to kill it. So this is why it's so effective to solo it. It's arguably even more effective to solo it than to duo it, because with this uh, method, you do not stand a chance of accidentally proxying the enemy fob and giving them more advanced notice. So the, what you do is, first off, if you make it more difficult to dig down a radio and make it take longer, now the hab becomes the priority target. Now you need to take down the top of the hab before you start thinking about killing the radio, because ultimately that's going to be the safer bet to stop spawns than trying to get the radio down enough to do so. So now if you're in a full infantry squad and you don't have an engineer, it becomes more of a hab-focused endeavor rather than sneaking off to go find the radio and being a bit more gamey. And if you're an engineer, you also probably want to go for the hab, because if you can still shuffle that down at the same rate, you can make it unspawnable fairly quickly. Whereas if you try to go for the radio, now you have a big problem, because you cannot place the C4 first. By the time you dig the radio down, enough for it to be destructible by the C4, the C4 will already have detonated. So you need to start with a shovel, and then get it to a certain point, and then place the C4, and then continue the shovel, which means they have very, very advanced notice that something is up with the radio before you actually get the C4 down, and long before you actually shovel it down enough that the C4 will kill it. This means that, ultimately, you cannot solo it without the enemy team being aware that it's being soloed well in advance before it's past the point of no return. And yet... The same thing applies here where teamwork can overcome this. If you have multiple people, well, you might be able to place the C4 down and then start shoveling and then get it past the stage of no return before the C4 detonates, which allows you to all survive. Or if you have multiple people, you may go prioritize the hab. Another thing that we can do is slightly reduce the amount of time it takes to dig down a hab so that, or sorry, the amount of hit points, so to speak, that a hab has so that a single C4 will take it down a layer. Now, instead of going after the radio, for which there's no real counter for, it might be viable to place the C4 on the hab, and then when that detonates, the spawn is gone, and the same thing has been accomplished. You have eliminated their ability to spawn, but you still need people there defending and um, prioritizing that hab to make sure it doesn't get rebuilt. It's not a solo endeavor. 
or you go to the radio with multiple people, you dig it down like I mentioned, and once again, this is not a solo endeavor. You're still powerful against the radio and you're still able to take it down fairly quickly, but it required multiple people. Or there's an option three, ammo. You get an engineer plus a rifleman, the rifleman drops the ammo bag, and now the engineer can place two C4s on the radio, which will take it down. And now you have used teamwork, which is something that you don't get in your average pub game. You have actually stuck together as both rifleman and engineer, prioritized your ammo for that, and you've been able to accomplish something great because two people work together. Similar to how two AT plus one ammo bag can immediately make short work of pretty much any armored vehicle, whereas a single lat running after an armored vehicle will shoot it, get it smoking, and then go complain on Reddit that lat's underpowered. You have this same teamwork philosophy when it comes to engineer and rifleman teamwork as you do when it comes to lat and rifleman teamwork, which is one of the cooler aspects of the game in my opinion. And yet, with all of this, we still have the same damage from projectiles against radio. An exposed radio is still damageable by A-10, still destroyable. Um, a vehicle can still appear and knock out a radio and not have to sit there and wait through a bleed-out timer, they're simply able to kill the structure and kill the fob. So you still get punished for exposing your radio to regular fire, and yet the engineer can no longer just waltz in and solo it without you getting advanced warning and a good reaction. He needs to bring more people and do it in a more clever way, involving more teamwork, in order to accomplish the same things that happen now. And yet with this system you don't end up with the same issues on defense. You can still get the same radio kill time with five people as you were able to before, so if your full squad is pushing a defensive fob, you can still take that down very quickly, and yet you don't have to sit there and wait through an arbitrary bleed-out timer to make sure nobody comes back and recovers it. You can just get it to the point it needs to be and then move on, and you still have the same offensive capabilities against radios as long as you have the teamwork aspect and you have the same number of people that the new bleed-out system would, say, require. With this change, you can also increase the ammo cost of C4s to make it less viable for the uh, riflemen to be able to supply them unless they are specifically saving ammo for them. Say, 70, which I believe is the same as a hat rocket, rather than 50, which now allows two C4s to technically be in the bag. So you need a resupply after every time you do this. Anyway, this is a way I think that you can adjust the current numbers to get the same desired result without adding this new arbitrary lead out period that has no visual indication that fucks with A10s, fucks with uh, 30 mils, fucks with any kind of auto cannon or tank round being able to be viable against structures, and then still puts the same amount of priority on teamwork to take out a radio, or just prioritizing habs and then treating radio as something to clean up when the area is secure, thus making it more of a firefight based thing and less of a sneaky game mechanic abuse type thing that it is now. Let me know what you think, and I uh, will see you guys in the next one.